good afternoon again. Uh, we will start with the second group of session of this afternoon. The session is entitled Case-Based Session, uh, Management of Antithrombotic Therapy in Complex PCI Scenarios. Uh, we have the pleasure to have with uh, us uh, today uh, Dr. Manel Sarate from Barcelona, Spain, Dr. Christian Hamm from Giessen, Germany, uh, Dr. Flavio Rivicini from Verona, Italy, and Dr. Uh, Walter Desmet from Leuven, Belgium. The cases will be presented by Dr. Lara Fuentes. Lara Fuentes is interventional cardiology in the Belvice University Hospital. Uh, and you have a simple system for voting. Uh, during the presentation, immediately after the appearance of a question mark, uh, a question with different options will be uh, presented uh, on the screen, and you will have uh, 20 seconds for uh, give your response. Uh, okay, the first session is uh, the first case is from our hospital. Lara, please. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, let's start with the first with the, with the first case. This is a 54 years old male, former smoker uh, with history of hypertension and dyslipidemia. He has a previous stroke and his cardiology history started in 2011 with a stable angina. In this moment, the angiography showed one vessel disease that was treated with a drug eluting stand in left circumflex. The patient also has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and he is treated with aspirin, rivaroxaban, 20 milligrams, enalapril, bisoprolol, and adorbacetin. The patient is referred for coronary angiography <coughs> due to progression of the angina the last three months with normal EKG and negative troponin, and the patient receives pretreatment with clopidogrel. This is the angiography. Here we can see the stand in proximal left circumflex, which is patent. And we can see in the right image a severe lesion <coughs> in the mid-right coronary artery that we are going to treat in this same procedure. So the patient receives treatment during the PCI with 80 milligrams of unfractioned heparin. And after wiring and after balloon predilation, the patient has an espiral coronary dissection uh, from osseal to the distal right coronary artery. And he has hemodynamic instability with two episodes of ventricular fibrillation. And this is the final angiographic result after four drug eluting stent implantation from osteal to distal right coronary artery. After the procedure, the patient uh, is reloaded with uh, 600 milligrams of clopidogrel. And he's admitted in the CCU, hemodynamically stable initially, but two hours after the PCI, he has an electrical storm with 27 episodes of sustained ventricular tachycardia that require defibrillation. He needs a retracular intubation, and after hemodynamic stabilization, the AKG shows inferior ST segment <coughs> elevation. So a new uh, coronary emergent angiography is done. So here we can see an acute stent thrombosis of the proximal stent in the right coronary artery. Uh, the wiring was uh, extremely difficult due to protrusion of the osteal stent into the aorta. Thrombus aspiration is performed. An ibus is performed also that shows minimal stent inf expansion in the mid uh, segment of the right coronary artery. So interesting balloon angioplasty is performed. And here comes the first question. Um, okay, remember that uh, it's a young, young patient, 54 years old, uh, treated with uh, rivaroxaban, previous uh, stroke, and uh, with implantation of uh, more than 100 millimeters of stent. And the patient presented an acute stent thrombosis two hours after, after the procedure. And the, que the question is, in this situation, what would be your immediate antithrombotic treatment strategy per procedure? The first option is uh, cangrelor plus unfractioned heparin. Uh, second, 2 3 inhibitor plus unfractioned heparin, or free just uh, unfractioned heparin. Now, uh, you can vote, please. Okay. Walter, what is your uh, recommendation? I okay. will uh, bias the people while they're voting. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, at this point in time, uh, it's, it's very unfortunate <laughs> to have this happen, but I, I think I would go for the uh, 2B3A inhibitor. It would be one of the very few patients 
that nowadays we would still give a to B3A <coughs> in, inhibitor. Uh, Flavia? It, it's very unlucky case because of this dissection. I mean, was it presented as a simple case. It's a relatively low risk patient because it's a male, it's a young male, but he has AFib, it's in triple therapy, and he had a stroke, so I'd be very prudent with the anti-thrombotic therapy. I, I am very mechanicistic, and I believe that the long, the long stented tract and the under-expanded stent in the mid-segment of the right coronary artery might have played an important role in this. So after doing an IVUS and getting an optimized expansion of all the stented tract, I would keep on the same therapy, just giving some more unfractional heparin and being very, very prudent with the antithrombotic therapy. Okay, the audience thinks that 55-51% uh, suggest uh, to if the inhibitor must plus some fractional heparin and 33% gangrelor. Uh, I think it's a very critical um, situation for the patient, and for this reason I would agree to give it a 2B3 inhibitor in this case, at least a bolus, for example, of tarofaman. And uh, definitely um, I would agree to do an, an IVOS or OCT and see how the stents are expanded. There must be some problems with the stents probably. And, and, uh, or distally maybe a flap or something like this. I mean, that usually has a reason. And uh, secondly, uh, um, it's that uh, maybe patient is resistant to clopidogrel and we have to change uh, for the long term the antiplatelet agent. And, uh, but I would take the risk of bleeding in this situation because it's such a critical situation. Okay, let us. So let's continue. <coughs> So the patient receives treatment with tyrofiban and unfractioned heparin. And this is the final result after another uh, osteal stent implantation uh, for two reasons, due to uh, osteal stent uh, distortion, due to difficult wiring through the struts, and also due to the section uh, observed uh, with the IBUS. So here comes the second question. Okay, the, the, this, this question related with immediate treatment after a successful PCA. Again, remember, patients with atrial fibrillation with uh, uh, indication of rivaroxaban, five stent implanted, acute stent thrombosis. What would be your treatment strategy <coughs> at, discharge, at discharge? One, aspirin plus clopidogrel plus NOAC, uh, triple anti, uh, antithrombotic treatment. Aspirin plus clopidogrel plus, plus vitamin uh, K uh, antagonist, triplet therapy with <coughs> vitamin K antagonist. Free evaluate clopidogrel response, and depending on the response to clopidogrel is with suprasugrel or ticagrelor. Option number four, NOAC plus <coughs> prasugrel or ticagrelor, only dual antithrombotic therapy. Or the uh, option number five, I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, you can vote now, Manel. Well, I think that uh, I'm tempted to say number five. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I truly believe that this case is an unfortunate case, of course, uh, due to a complication. And also the thrombosis is more related to a mechanical issue than probably a probably, uh, hematological issue from the patient. Um, uh, you implant four stents and then in a, in a rush situation and probably the infra expansion of the stents, overlapping, etc., may cause this uh, thrombotic uh, event and then the dissection of the ostium. So it uh, was, was really uh, uh, more, more mechanical than probably a hematological disorder. Uh, therefore, I think once the, the patient is stable and after two, three, four days without, without any further event, uh, I would keep on triple therapy, uh, maybe with clopidogrel. I, I, in this case, maybe the test of the resistance could be an option, just in case, because you don't want, as 54 years old, you don't want to, to have another ventricular fibrillation at home a few days after. Uh, but if the good responder, I would keep on triple therapy with NOAC, of course. Okay. And then no rise to to downgrade to du dual therapy. Yeah, okay. Maybe one month, triple therapy, and then wait a little bit more. Any, any different uh, suggestion? Yes, I would go differently, I think, <laughs> because, of, because it's many long stands. Uh, 
I guess I, I would give a, a stronger uh, P2Y12 inhibitor like uh, ticagrelor, for example, together with the NOAC, and I would leave out the aspirin. I know I'm not backed up by major evidence in saying so, but uh, um, and this discussion will take place tomorrow, the dual versus uh, triple therapy. Um, and I would, uh, in this case, I would probably continue ticagrelor for like six months or so. If it would be a shorter standard segment, uh, I would keep it very short, like three months or maybe only one month, and then continue on NOAC alone. But it's uh, yeah, personal. Okay, it's, 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 it's the following question. Uh, Lara, please. Yeah. <clears throat> So the patient was admitted in the SCCU, hemodynamically stable. He was extubated 24 hours the second procedure with a new ventricular arrhythmias. And the decision was to make a clopidogrel well response evaluation. And the patient was found to be a non-responder with a BASP of 73 PRI. Remember, patients are non-responder when BASP is more than 50%. And the verify now was 241 PRU. Remember, patients are non-responder when the value is uh, over 208. So the treatment decision was to make a switch from clopidogrel to ticagrelor. <coughs> the echo showed uh, practically a normal ejection fraction. And the patient was discharged uh, 10 days after with uh, this treatment, aspirin, ticagrelor, and a direct oral anticoagulant, which was rivaroxaban. And one year after uh, this event, he remained asymptomatic. So now comes the third and last question of this okay. case. The last question is related with the very long-term treatment of this particular patient with a <coughs> different complex option. Uh, the option number one is uh, aspirin plus ticagrelor, one month of triple antithrombotic therapy, followed by uh, one year of uh, tubal antithrombotic therapy, followed by only uh, NOAC monotherapy. Option two, uh, triple antithrombotic therapy with ticagrelor during three to six months, followed by double antithrombotic therapy with aspirin and NOAC. Option three, triple antithrombotic therapy with ticagrelor and NOAC, followed by double antithrombotic therapy with NOAC plus clopidogrel. Number four, triple antithrombotic therapy only one month, plus uh, double antithrombotic therapy indefinitely. And the option five, I have no idea. Uh, you can vote, please. Uh, Flavia. Well, uh, I, if, if I, I don't go wrong, I think that guidelines would recommend, recommend the first option. I think this could be quite acceptable, with the exception of considering this uh, long stented track. But again, if, if this is about new generation stents, apart from the trials that recommend specific brand, I, I think that the newer either permanent polymer or bioabsorbable polymer are <coughs> as safe one uh, as the other, although the evidence is in favor of phonics and, and, and biosensors because these are the trials that have tested very short dual antiplatelet therapy of one month in high bleeding rate. So I will keep as most of you on, on the first option. But I do something more. I mean, it's a young patient. Why should he be in, in atrial fibrillation? He had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation during the acute coronary syndrome. If we can monitor his, uh, his heart rate with, uh, with, um, <clears throat> with a loop recorder and he's not in, in, uh, in atrial fibrillation anymore, I get rid of the NOC. Uh, Why not? Christian? No, I would not get rid of the NOC. If you have had atrial fibrillation, your history, you always have a high risk no, for, for a stroke. One paroxystic. No, you came in with atrial fibrillation. Yeah, you had several episodes. Several, 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 one stroke. Okay. So in, in, in dark, So I would not stop. No the, the long term, I, at the long term, as in it's written in, in option one, the, the only drug I would leave forever if he has recurrence mm -hmm. uh, atrial then, fib, which is very unlikely for a young patient like this. Now, do we have enough uh, evidence to add a P2Y12 inhibitor or even aspirin to the NOAC in the long term? I mean, let's say after no, one no. year or so. So, uh, no, don't. isn't it a, an option to, after, I don't know, six months or one year, just keep the NOAC and get rid of the aspirin? Get after one month? Of, no, 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 uh, longer, six or 12 uh, as months. As it's written in option one. So you agree yeah, I would even one. change <laughs> option one. To, I haven't. Uh, I would personally would give a triple therapy, aspirin, ticagrelor, NOAC for one month and then take out the aspirin. <laughs> 
and Ticagrelor and uh, Noak for 12 months and then continue yeah. on Noak only. Oh, that would be my would have been my choice. There's no option here, but uh, the, the response of the audience is very yeah. Is There's very, so many very, choices very here. <laughs> yes. Uh, one, one last question: Do you think that the uh, evaluation of the platelet reactivity uh, can be indicated clearly in this complex patient to uh, guide the, the long-term uh, follow-up with a patient with a high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk? <coughs> So, Christian, what was your question? The question is if uh, the evaluation of platelet reactivity with yeah. uh, functional uh, test is, uh, can, can give uh, several uh, information about the final decision with the antiplatelet therapy. Yeah, we all know that these platelet function tests are not very reliable and not very predictive for events. So I do it sometimes as I would have done it here in this case, but otherwise... Uh, don't do it routinely. We know that patients that are non-responders to clopidogrel, yeah, the majority don't get in a stent thrombosis for what reason soever, because just our tests are just not very good. That's that's the, the problem. But uh, but uh, okay. that's that's why I know we don't have, uh, as Walter said, we don't have data on uh, um, the combination of antiplatelet with Loax after. Uh, 12 months, and so uh, I mean, I continue in very in, in some patients that have diffuse disease and thing, I, and have low risk of bleeding. I continue with aspirin and Enoac, but uh, you, uh, in most patients, I have the patients only on Enoac than a long term. In, in, in this in this patient with several <coughs> events of thrombosis, would you remove? Uh, the ticagrelor and keep the just the aspirin or the opposite because yeah it's a patient that uh, had not just one at the acute but also three days later maybe okay is there are any comments yes just one question mm -hmm. so, uh, actually you don't protect the patient against thrombosis if you give only aspirin for one month to be very honest um, you don't protect the patient uh, more if you add after 12 months something indefinitely. So to me, the single option is to give Ticagrelor for three to six months with no, with, an, with or without aspirin, depending on his bleeding risk. You have to get the depth score and to assess the bleeding risk. And then after uh, 12 months to give NOAC. You can't add something just because you believe you have a high stent thrombosis after one year. I mean, from, from all yes. the, you know, maybe I comment this from all the NOAC trials, particularly NTRUST trial, the lately, latest trial, I think there's some evidence uh, or some yeah, so, so little evidence that there's an increased risk of stent thrombosis if you don't have aspirin during the first, let's say, two weeks or one month. Edoxaban and the other trials also, you see it also in Pioneer. With uh, rivaroxaban, there's all the signal at least. It's not very strong because it's not powered for this. Therefore, if the patient has no excessive bleeding risk, I would at least for the first week, better for, for the first uh, months, have the patient on triple therapy. But after that, I think aspirin has no value anymore, probably, and then it causes only bleeding. A, a quick comment from my side. Actually, we have four studies all together with four different NOACs showing that across the board, irrespective of the NOAC type, you have an risk of stent thrombosis if you associate NOAC plus clopidogrel. There were also some Ticagros, some Prasic, but were less than 5 6%, so basically there is no evidence there. And on the other side, the long term, we do have one study, which is only one, a FIRE study, where patient with a history of AFib were randomly located to receive only rivaroxaban or a combination of rivaroxaban or either aspirin or clopidogrel at discretion of the treating physician. That study took place in Japan, so at the Japanese regimen, which means 15 milligram of xarelto, but that study showed an excess of bleeding, an excess of mortality, an excess of maize disfavoring the combination. So that study was actually prematurely stopped at the ASMB and actually the winning gamble was clearly NOAC. However, that study would not apply to that patient because patients with the history of stent thrombosis were excluded. So we are discussing a data-free zone patient, unfortunately. 
Uh, yes, uh, the last uh, comment, please, or the last question. I'm Daniel Ardi from Hungary. Uh, I would like to offer some comments about the playlist reactivity value. Um, I had done many studies with playlist function testing, and I'm a proponent of, of in some situation to get this information. However, in this particular patient, I would refrain doing the playlist function testing because we have some clinical evidence of inefficiency. In this patient, it was pretreated with clopidogrel before PCI, and before having the stent thrombosis event, even he was given another loading dose of 600 clopidogrel. We knew from studies of Bonello that even you can have three or four uh, 600 loading doses without a large effect, but after two loading doses with a stent thrombosis is a clear clinical confirmation that something is not perfect. I agree that also, there is some interventional problem, the under-expansion, but usually thrombotic and interventional complications go hand by hand. So in this patient, when I have a clinical proof of a stent thrombosis with such a long segment, uh, I would switch to the potent P2Y12 inhibitor to protect this patient with, with whatever <coughs> I can do from another thrombotic event. Regarding plate function testing, one aspect is you show that uh, WASP and uh, the, the Verify Now were done. So if you give tyrofibin, um, WASP is still valid in the first uh, 24 hours because it's not affected by the GPI, but Verify Now can be affected by the GPI effect if it's not completely washed out. So Verify Now should be done after 24 hours as you may have done it. It was done four days. Yeah, yeah. Then, so it was evolution. correct, but not all the plate function tests have the proper value when you give the GPI. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next uh, case, please. Yeah. <coughs> so the second case is a 68 years old female with hypertension and dyslipidemia. She has, uh, she has a stable effort angina, functional class two, which was initially treated uh, medically with aspirin and alapril, visoprolol, and atorvastatin. But the last three months, the patient has progression of symptoms, and an echo stress is done, showing severe, severe anterolateral ischemia with normal ejection fractal, fraction, so the patient is referred for coronary angiography. This is the left coronary artery. We can see a severe long lesion in mid LED. <coughs> and this is the right coronary artery uh, where we don't have any significant lesion. So the idea is to treat LED, and here comes the first question. Okay, the first question related with the uh, pretreatment or the uh, strategy to treat the patient uh, just before uh, the intervention. Uh, PCI seems complex, and the patient did not receive the uh, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor pretreatment. What would you do? Option one, Cangrelor. Option two, 2 be 3 inhibitors. Option three, clopidogrel load pre-PCI. Or option four, clopidogrel load post-PCI. Uh, you can vote, please. Uh, Manel? Well, in, in my practice, this patient uh, received cl clopidogrel immediately after the procedure, because the patient isn't there, he's not going to, to, to receive the pill lying on the table, probably. Uh, but um, I was thinking uh, of changing to Ticagrel if you consider that this is unstable angina, progressive angina, and then you have a more room to, to give something. Cangrel is not available, at least in my hospital, so it's nothing that uh, we can do right now. Mm -hmm. Walter. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Manel is so honest because I think it usually it happens in most places just to do the case and load <coughs> the patient with clopidogrel after the case. Only 6% here uh, said he would do this, but I'm sure actually they're uh, lying a bit. Um, <laughs> and of course, in this setting, the number one is the correct answer. And probably it is the good way to go, uh, but we have uh, uh, Kangalor at our uh, disposal uh, since uh, a few months, but it's, uh, the, the reimbursement is still a problem, so that is an issue. Um, to load pre-PCI is useless unless you postpone the PCI for a day or so. Um, 
And um, so I think what we usually do is four, number four. Uh, Flavia. Yes, really? exactly the same. Well, uh, what, what we would consider to have a quicker antiplatelet effect is using ticagrelor on the patients, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. oh, with the patient on, on the table. This is what we do, treating as an unstable case because she had uh, unstable angina in the last weeks. So, and, and you have a quicker effect on the platelets. And, yes. and probably then sh sh shifting probably to clopidogrel before discharge. Okay. Yes? Another option to achieve a fast effect would be to use prasugrel and then you would have difficulties in switching to clopidogrel We would start with uh, Prasugrel 60 milligram on the table, and it's not a problem. They can drink it with a uh, straw, and, and then it's fine. So, so, before but, but the then procedure? Before the procedure. Well, once the decision is made to go for PCI, which is easily done, then at least we have an early uh, onset of platelet inhibition, and no problem with going on with clopidogrel, which would create a problem with the mm -hmm. But quite honestly, quite probably the true platelet inhibition would only take place after the procedure if yes, you're but, but a good only, operator. But only one hour after the procedure yeah. and not four hours after the no, procedure. No, no, but I agree. I would use Ticagrelor or, or Prasugrel, uh, but I, I'm not sure if it's useful to try and make the patient swallow the it's no pill. Problem. And no problem. <laughs> <laughs> In Germany, it's no problem. <laughs> Okay. Well, the answer number one is consequence of the, of the excellent talk of uh, uh, Dr. Ferreiro, because 35% yes. of the people uh, uh, suggest clank cangrelor. Okay. Uh, Lara? Yeah. So, uh, our idea was to do number four, to give a loading dose after the procedure. So, uh, the lesion was predilated, and after that, uh, two drug eluting stents were implanted, covering the whole lesion. The patient receives during the procedure an antithrombotic uh, treatment with infraction heparin. This is the postulation of the overlap zone of the two stents. And that's what happens after that. An mm -hmm. L3 coronary perforation is observed. Okay, uh, the next question is related with the uh, immediately uh, treatment. Remember that the patient uh, has been implanted two stents, uh, 55 millimeters, without uh, anti oral antiplatelet treatment, and the patient <coughs> presenta uh, coronary severe coronary perforation. Uh, and after prolonged balloon inflation, the perforation is uh, still not sealed. What would be your next step? Option one, coagulation reversion and new evaluation. Option two, anticoagulation reversion and covered stent implantations. Three, cover the stent implantation without coagulation reversion. And four, keep the balloon inflated and call the surgeon. Uh, you can vote. Uh, the question is related with uh, reversion coagulation with or without a uh, covered stent implantation. Uh, well, I, I would go for uh, seven, uh, which is three plus four. <laughs> I would, uh, I would th think... Uh, Call for a covered, well, keep the balloon inflated, call for a covered stand, quickly place the covered, covered stand, and meanwhile also warn the surgeons that okay. maybe, just maybe, something may be coming to uh, them. The question related with reversion of coagulation, yes or not? I guess not. Uh, of course, one could say at this moment in time, bleeding is the biggest After balloon inflation, the, the preparation biggest reverts, threat. Yeah? The, the balloon inflation, uh, several balloon inflation has been performed. Yeah, yeah, but the, 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 this will not close uh, without the covered stand. Uh, the, you need a covered stand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just, uh, Flavio. Yes, I would go with the, with the covered stand. <coughs> and if, if you get a good result, I would not uh, revert the anticoagulation. Yes, so it, the, all it, the panel agree? No reversal yes. of anticoagulation? Yes, because 60 millimeters long stand plus a covered stand uh, without coagulation, then you have a thrombosis. Next step, eh? so I would, I would just put the cover stand, and 
Be patient. Yeah. Okay. Marco, any comment? No, I would like to ask a part of the question, actually. In this case, can you dare to deflate the balloon quickly and insert the cover stand quickly, just uh, preparing yourself with the puncture of the pericardial? Or would you do a ping pong technique? Leave the balloon inflated, take another axis, go there, prepare everything, and then deflate only when you're ready. Because I would do the second here, unless you're already puncturing. <laughs> on, on, on my opinion, the simplest you do is the better, and putting a stand deflating the balloon, it's yeah. 10 seconds, and you will not need to make the drainage. What, what I agree with Walter is that this patient, if she dies, she will not die about if, because of the infarction, because it's a me to distal LED, she will die about bleeding. So the surgeon should be at, uh, in, in, in the nearby, because even after putting the, the, the cover stent, she might bleed in the night and the day after. So this is a very dangerous situation. Anyway, even if you get with a wood immediate result, it's very high risk patient. Okay, uh, any other yeah, yeah, I will try harder to get around to get it around the covered stand. I would have everything prepared, but usually if you have, uh, many times you have inflated the balloon for five or ten minutes, put the patient on morphine, so that's, if the same dem is stable, uh, usually, then that usually, frequently it covers, and then you don't need to put in a covered stand, because then you create some... <coughs> Additional problems, the vessel is not so large here, and put in a covered stand. Of mm. course, you must have the tool available. The, the, this is a nasty... It's, it's, it's very a nasty. A it's period. a raptor, it's not a yeah, perforation. It's, it's, I guess uh, you will not manage with only balloon, but of no, course you no, can try. At least you can try and take your time. And, uh, okay. So let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. So the patient at this moment, uh, she already has severe pericardial effusion with hemodynamic okay. instability. She requires uh, emergent pericardial synthesis. And the decision was to reverse uh, coagulation with protamine and to implant uh, two covered stents. So the perforation is sealed, but we have uh, another important problem, which is stent thrombosis. And as you can see, also uh, a large amount of thrombus in left main. We told you not to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, OK, and the following and now what? <laughs> it's, uh, now you're in trouble. OK, the, the denticoagulation was only partially reversed, OK? And uh, you have a coronary perforation, uh, apparently sealed, two DS, two cover stents, and a partial reversion of heparin with protamine. How would you treat this complication? Option one, the risk of new bleeding is very high. I would only aspirate. Option two, thrombus aspiration plus new and fraction of heparin dose administration. Three, thrombus aspiration plus bivalirudine administration. And bivalirudine has been associated with a reduced in the bleeding risk, and four, thrombus aspiration plus intracoronary GP2 P3A administration because the perforation has been sealed. You can vote. Anel? <laughs> thrombus aspiration for sure, and uh, see what happened after that. The patient uh, left main also affected. Eh? Yes. So this uh, maybe uh, impella around and all this stuff eh? because uh, and surgeons around as well. That probably impella would be an option. Eh? 50, uh, because of the entire situation. And uh, after aspiration, depending on what I see with the flow, if the, I restore the flow, maybe nothing else. Uh, if there's, again, you need to, to dilate more or to do something else, then maybe give some heparin. <coughs> okay, uh, Walter. Uh, I guess I would give some heparin, but this might be a good ca case to consider using Kangalore, because you can switch it on and, and, and monitor the patient, and in case you have uh, documentation of, of new bleeding or continued oozing or whatever, you can uh, put it off again. Because uh, 10 minutes ago, the, the life of this patient was uh, jeopardized by a bleed, and right now it's in danger <laughs> because of uh, an anterior infarction. So, um, so it becomes a... a, a a difficult game. Uh, okay, you can see that 35% uh, uh, suggest thrombus aspiration plus uh, unfractioned heparin, mm -hmm. and 44% thrombus aspiration plus intracoronary gp 2 a administration. Uh, Flavio? Yes, there is, there is no scientific-based uh, advice. I think it's more a 
practice and common sense. I would do, like uh, Manel said, gain some, some heparin and aspirating, but it's very important that you keep the blood pressure of this patient because until you manage to get the vessel uh, open, the patient might die because of hypotension. And so the most important thing, if, if she is uh, very hypertensive, to put the patient on, on left ventricular assistance and then you have the time to decide. And of course, at that time, the patient <coughs> is deeply anticoagulated because either with ECMO or with Impella, you will need to use your unfractionate heparin. And so I would focus on that, blood pressure and heparin. Okay, any comment uh, from the audience? No? Lara? Yeah, let's continue. So thrombus aspiration was performed, and a lower dose of unfractioned um, heparin was administrated, 50 milligrams in this case. The previous dose uh, was uh, 60. And this is the final result. Mm -hmm. Excellent result without uh, thrombus, without uh, bleeding. So the patient was admitted in the CCU stable without pericardial effusion in the echo. The drainage was removed 24 <coughs> hours after the procedure. The patient had a really good clinical evolution without significant rise in troponin, without EKG changes or chest pain. And she was discharged, uh, di discharged at home five days after with uh, aspirin and clopidogrel. Okay, yes? Was, um, was any thrombus captured? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, large, large thrombus. Okay. I, 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 I want to say something, but in more in the interest of young people. I know it may be not nice, but you know, sometimes cases become very complex because there is a stupid, stupid. I mean, a simple mistake in the beginning, and and we said in the beginning, don't revert heparin in this case. So everything got much more dangerous just because you are frightened about the bleeding and expert people know that it's just about putting one, you put two, means that you miss the first one. Ideally, one cover stand, proper length, proper, proper <coughs> size, and this could have been much easier. In, in the previous case, you did the PCI with an unplugged catheter, an unplugged guiding. And again, this is a... This is a they are not my bit. cases. No, I'm not <laughs> telling you. <laughs> Because we have all done this. No, we all did this. We all did this. And so the, there must be really a very strong reason for you to use an unplugged guiding catheter when you do a right coronary. Because the, the risk of di the dissection is, is much higher. You know that. So that's, it's a very okay, practical no, 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 comment. No, no, not, not for her, but good. to all of us, because we have all done dissections in the coronaries and have bleeding and thrombosis. But it's, it's like this. Sometimes a simple mistake makes it much bigger. Okay, uh, is that now for comments? Okay, let's go to the next uh, So the let's case. move to the third yes. and last case. This is a 60 years old male, former smoker with dyslipidemia. He had two previous neoplasias, a lymphoma like 20 years ago, and a prostate adenocarcinoma 15 years ago with complete remission of both neoplasias. And the cardiology history started in 2005 with an anastemi treated with a BMS in distal RCA, and with a stable angina in 2008, uh, treated with a second BMS in distal RCA to posterior lateral. The patient was asymptomatic till uh, last year uh, when he is admitted due to a non STEMI with positive troponin, but without EKG changes. The patient is treated uh, with uh, aspirin, tegagrelor, and enoxaparin, and 24 hours after, the angiography is performed we can see the left coronary artery with severe ectasia without significant lesions. We can see uh, collateral circulation to the right coronary artery, which is the culprit, which is uh, a severe, uh, severe ectastic artery with a thrombotic occlusion in the mid-segment. <coughs> so uh, unfractioned heparin is uh, given in this patient Thrombus aspiration is performed, obtaining a large macroscopic uh, thrombus. Here you can see in the right the image after thrombus aspiration. And here comes the first question of this case. Okay, the question is related with the uh, intracoronary imaging. Remember, it's a patient with uh, coronary ectasia plus uh, high uh, <coughs> thrombus burden with uh, probably uh, very late stent thrombosis with two stents implanted in the distal 
by coronary artery. And the question is, uh, what, uh, what do you perform intracoronary imaging in this situation? Uh, always uh, OCT. I put Im imaging with IBUS or uh, not uh, intracoronary imaging. You can vote, please. Uh, Manel? Uh, if uh, I would use IVUS rather than OCT because of the size of the vessel, uh, with OCT is a big, such a big vessel, and uh, probably IVUS would give more the, the sizing of the eventual or potential additional stain if needed. Hopefully not, but... Uh, uh, and also to understand whether there is a cause uh, of the uh, thrombosis. Uh, this patient has these two cancer episodes and probably thrombotic uh, the disorder already is, uh, associated with all this situation. So. Okay, the response of the audience is very, with high variability. Sorry, uh, I was 28 uh, OCT and, uh, sorry, uh, OCT 16, 30, I was see, no intercoronary imaging, 24. Uh, Flavio. I think that when, when you have a stent failure, you should have a look at it. This is written in the guidelines. If a stent is occluded, you, you should have a look at it because of probably under expansion in such big vessel. Uh, even if you do your best, you will never be able to oppose this stent in such a big vessel. So it will give you information. Regarding IVUS and OCT, no doubt this is a case for IVUS because of the size, but also because of the contrast media. You have to give a lot of contrast. And then you have thrombus, so very likely, despite the contrast, you will not have a good imaging distal to the stenosis. So OCT would be, uh, in my opinion, uh, not cost effective. Okay, Christian, any additional comment? Um, if you have it available, I would first try to do clear stand. Just a very easy, quick shot to see what's going on. Sometimes gives you already the information what is wrong with the stent. <coughs> if that's not, I would also prefer IVUS because of the size of the vessel. Okay. Uh, Lara? Yeah. So the decision in this patient, the operator <laughs> decision, not mine, <laughs> was to perform an OCT. It was difficult to advance the OCT, so uh, it was needed a catheter extensor. Okay, and uh, uh, this is what happened uh, during the OCT acquisition, that the thrombus in the mid-segment uh, migrates to the proximal part of the right coronary artery. And, the, and here you can see the OCT. Yes, yes, tell them. That, that, that's because of the power injection yes. of the 25 yes. cc at high pressure. Yes. It me. Yeah, it's it's a little bad luck. Thrombus so go, should go forward, not backward. Because it went to the orchard. Um, no. Did the patient show any clinical signs no. elsewhere in the. No, not, <laughs> no stroke, no systemic embolism, no apparent complication due to really? this problem. It's unbelievable. So it dissolved in the orchard. Mm -hmm. So here you can see the OCT. <laughs> As Manel said, probably OCT was not the best uh, image technique in this case due to the size of the vessel. We can only see thrombus and probably <coughs> neointima proliferation, arrestenotic uh, intrastent lesion. But uh, nothing clear with this OCT apart from large uh, thrombus. Interesting. <coughs> So here is the angel after the OCT. The patient at this moment was stable, was asymptomatic, no chest pain. We have a distal TME2 flow. And now okay. Uh, the patient is asymptomatic with a TME2 flow uh, mm, with a, a critical lesion in the uh, distal right coronary artery with thrombus in the bifurcation. Uh, what we would be your treatment strategy, and balloon predilatation, option two, direct stent implantation, option three, intracoronary thrombolysis, for balloon predilatation to improve the flow and continue with anticoagulation and dual antiplatelet therapy and perform the PCI in a second stage procedure. And on option five, continue with anticoagulation, dual antiplatelet therapy and ship 2 b 3 a inhibitors and PCI in second stage procedure. The question mainly is uh, in the same procedure or in a stage procedure. Uh, you can vote, please. Uh, Walter. 
Well, if we wouldn't have seen that big, big thrombus go away, I would have chosen number five because if that, if you start doing whatever inside such a thrombus, you, you, you're bound to get problems by by this, uh, disrupting this clot and so on. So in that case, I would have gone for option five, as apparently 90% or more of the thrombus uh, has left the artery. Um, I would go for a conventional PCI. Maybe with a balloon pre-dilatation and then implant a stent. I would not go for option four. It's a, this is a strategy that has been tried in, in classical STEMI, let's say. Um, I don't okay. think it's a good way. Uh, any different op uh, opinion? There, there has been several reports, case reports of the good result with intracranial thrombolysis. Not, not now, as you mentioned, but before removing the clot with the OCT uh, in, in this uh, aneurysmatic vessel sometimes, uh, it works. It's something that we never use in clinical practice, but uh, maybe an indication for such uh, aneurysmatic vessels. But Not at that moment that where everything is open, the team is rather okay. I would keep maybe trying to aspirate the distal part of the RDP, the, the right uh, posterior descending, uh, and maybe just treat the, the, the small spot which was not dilated at that site with a balloon and see what happens afterwards. Uh, 44% of the people decide to continue with active coagulation, 2E3A inhibitors, and perform the procedure in a second stage. Christian? Yes, I would, I would agree because the experience shows that if you go back to the patient in you know, 40, 24, 48 hours, sometimes the vessel is completely clean of thrombus. And then you have uh, can make the decision, you know, where to place the stand, what to dilate, and it looks completely different. So, uh, to me, two flow is not very nice to have. That's why I would probably softly pre-dilate. But you may make the things worse if you pre-dilate and you get some more thrombus. So definitely um, PCI in a second procedure, definitely, and have a second look here. Uh, Fabio, one, <laughs> it's one, one two. There, there is no science. The good thing is that she has a good collateral flow from the yeah. left. Yeah. And this is why, the, 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 despite the TIMI2, she has no pain and probably it's a lower risk. So you, uh, you, you, can, you can do this safely to, to keep the patient. Although I agree with you that this has been shown not to be the best uh, strategy, maybe it's the safest. It's the safest because you have collateral circulations with anticoagulation. The vessel will... Uh, look much better if you check it two or three days later. But uh, I, I do the PCI. I do the PCI. Although it has been shown that thrombus aspiration is not indicated, it, it, I think it's even class three in the guidelines. In all the cases we have been using this thrombus aspiration, we have it, we use it, it's, uh, sometimes it's effective. And I would finish the, you, you have the imaging, I mean, you have the OCT. I would like to have a nivus catheter to size my stent and to finish the procedure. Okay, uh, you can uh, you can have the the, the screen because uh, don't work. No, we okay, it. it's okay. Uh, Clara, uh, so let's let's continue with the case. <coughs> okay. So uh, we decided to do the last uh, option as the majority of the audience, uh, and that was to continue with dual antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation, and also tyrofiban uh, intravenous perfusion during 24 hours, and to repeat the angiography to decide revascularization management a few days after. The patient uh, didn't have any bleeding complication. Uh, he was asymptomatic, and the new angiography was performed six days after the first procedure. And as Christian said, the artery is completely clean of thrombus. We can see a focal lesion in the distal right coronary artery that is treated with a 4.18 drug looting stent with this final result. Okay, the last, the last question is related with the long-term treatment of this particular patient, a patient with a severe coronary ectasia with uh, uh, stent thrombosis and acute coronary syndrome and important thrombus burden during the uh, acute syndrome. 
Uh, what is your antithrombotic treatment uh, at the follow-up? Option one, aspirin plus ticagrelor, two in one year. Option two, aspirin plus ticagrelor, 90 milligrams, followed by aspirin plus ticagrelor, 60 milligrams, long-term, Pegasus strategy. Or three, option three, aspirin plus ticagrelor, uh, 12 months, followed by aspirin plus rivaroxaban, uh, compass strategy. You can vote, please. Uh, Manel? I would give uh, prasubra mm -hmm. in, I would in think this the type of thing. patients. In fact, I have a couple of patients like that, and the pressure for not just one year, but two or three years, young patients, of course, not... Uh, and uh, I, I have the feeling that it's more potent and probably in such an... But it's just a feeling. I will have any study with aneurysmatic coronary artery disease. But uh, I would go for, uh, for this, this uh, in this case, this P2Y12 inhibitor. And at one year, either keep on parasugrel or the Pegasus strategy, which is a little bit yeah, awkward. But, uh, what about the compass strategy? Yeah. Two ways to treat uh, this particular patient? Yeah, and the coagulation is attractive yeah. in, this, in, this, in this context also. Yeah. That's an interesting concept here, this aneurysm uh, coronary arteries. Uh, I have always the feeling that antiplatelet management is not enough. You need a little bit of anticoagulation. That's why the compass strategy here is, is maybe very clever to do. But, uh, of course, uh, we don't know. But I actually would prefer this, although... Uh, to have this aneurysm where you don't have flow, where you have stasis of the blood, and there may be you know, some little bit of anticoagulation more helpful than antiplatelet management. I, I, I agree. I, I think this, these arteries behave like veins, <laughs> <laughs> so they need a more venous treatment. Yes. Uh, but I don't think there's a lot of evidence. Was any imaging done after the stenting, actually? No. Wow. Mm. <laughs> but there was a, there, there was an uh, OCT probe there. <laughs> that you no, did, like it you wasn't said. done. No? Do you think that this image uh, will change the, the, the treatment in the follow-up? An additional image at that, wow. that time? It's such a huge vessel, so you had stem from <coughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you have the luxury of two days later or some days later to do imaging, so the selfie is more or less. Yeah, I also think I, I would have done um, so intracoronary imaging in this case, but it That's wasn't done. It's six millimeters. Yeah. And you put in a four and a half step. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you totally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any comment? Uh, any question? Okay, uh, we finished this session. Thank you, thank you very much for the panel. It's very difficult to be here. Okay? Excellent case.